So, good evening, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to this evening discussion, which kicks off a series of events that will carry us through the 80th anniversary of the day, five months from now. This anniversary will give us a chance to once again express our gratitude and uh, to honor every soldier who contributed to the liberation of France, all the men and women from the United States, Canada, and the UK, who did their part to ensure that freedom will triumph over oppression, democracy over totalitarianism, and humanity over barbarity. In Washington, it will give us a chance to celebrate our shared history, the deep-rooted solid alliance between the United States and France that began nearly 250 years ago. Between uh, now and June, you will have the opportunity to attend a poster exhibit created by the American Battle Monuments Commission, a classical concert featuring the Michigan Quartet and Jazz Dance at the June 6 Liberation Bowl. June 6 is, of course, a key date in our commemoration. It is the date that General Eisenhower declared as he was about to write one of the most important pages in world history, I quote, Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, the eyes of the world are open you. The hope and prayers of liberty living people, loving people everywhere, march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on our fronts. This evening, event will explore historic perspective of the liberation but it won't uh, focus solely, solely on the Normandy landing. The province landing and the liberation of Paris will also be examined. <laughs> examined. We, have, um, we are fortunate to have with us tonight three eminent historians who will be our guides on the journey into the past. <laughs> so Michael uh, Nalberg is a professor of history who serves as the uh, inaugural chair of war studies in the Department of National Security and Strategy at the United States Army War College in Carolina, Pennsylvania. Craig, Craig Simons is professor emeritus at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, where he serves as uh, chairman of the history department. And um, Frank Blazic is a curator of modern military history at the Smithsonian Institution National Museum of American History. And Ellen Cooper, a Pentagon correspondent for the New York Times, has very kindly agreed to moderate the discussions. I would like also to um, express my warmest thanks to our loyal partners, Airbus, INSPAS, BNP, Paribas, and Michelin, for lending their support to this uh, event. Before I turn the evening over the, to Ellen Cooper and our guest, I would like to draw your attention to a wonderful project by the Best Defense Foundation in partnership with Delta Airlines and Michelin. They will be accompanying the American veterans who are traveling to Normandy for the June 6th commemoration. I want to honor the unwavering commitment and initiative of Denis Edwards, president of the Best Defense Foundation, Bob Summers and Virginie Durr of Delta Airlines, and David Chapman of Mission North America, who have worked so hard to make this happen. I've seen pictures from previous trips that veterans have made to Normandy, and I can tell you that the sense of connection between the veterans and the people of Normandy is absolutely extraordinary and says more than long speeches ever could. So I want to wrap up my remarks by warmly thanking each and every one of you for coming to, to tonight's uh, inaugural event. And I wish you a fascinating event. And uh, now please give a very warm welcome to our historians and moderator. Good evening, my name is Bob Summers, I'm with Delta Airlines. 
We're very, very happy to be with you this evening. Well, Swap, and thank you, Ambassador Billy. We really are looking forward to hearing all about tonight, learning more about D-Day and the liberation of Europe with this esteemed panel of, uh, of experts here. They're gonna help us understand. That's all we've been doing for the last several years is learning and educating ourselves on more. And I've been very honored to be involved with the historic event as Ambassador Billy referred to in a variety of ways over the past couple of years. So many incredible memories from last year's charter to Normandy in partnership with not only my Delta colleagues, but my friends and partners at Michelin and the Best Defense Foundation. Um, my top memory, flying into Normandy on a Delta airplane, landing in Normandy for the first time. Uh, it was a wild idea five years ago. We said we could do it, it's never been done before. We did it for the first time last year. We'll do it again this year for the 80th anniversary. We're very excited about that. You know, the best way to facilitate these aging veterans is to really fly into Normandy and to watch their faces when we did was amazing. That historic landing filled with high emotion, not just for the veterans, but for all of us who were on that airplane. It was incredible. Um, and for us, when you think about memories, for me personally, I was able to, to join the group last year, standing obviously on Omaha Beach on D-Day at the very exact time when our troops took the, the be hit the beaches at six, I think at 6.18 a.m. was something I will never forget for the rest of my life. Honoring our vets also means educating the next generation so that our veterans are never forgotten. Thanks to the Best Defense Foundation for including young students aboard not only the charter, but throughout the entire Normandy program. And I want to emphasize that at Delta Airlines, our support for veterans goes way beyond just the D-Day charter event. 100,000 employees uh, are committed to taking care of the ones who took care of us. You will hear that. That is the motto of the Best Defense Foundation, uh, and we live by that every day. In anticipation of this year's anniversary, together with our partners, we are launching a program for employees to volunteer and serve World, World War II veterans all around the country, all around the world, year long, beyond, far beyond the D-Day events. And I cannot be more thrilled and honored to return to Normandy in just a few months with our veterans. I'm really excited about it but I don't think I can do any, any justice to it. So now I have the perfect way to sum up the anticipation. Let's take a look at a quick video produced by our partners at the Best Defense Foundation. On D-Day, the pursuit to take the backyard had begun, and the channel was the relentless bombardment from the greatest armada the world had ever seen. And beyond these cliffs was a country praying to be free of tyranny that had plagued the continent of Europe for over four years. Those prayers were finally answered as liberating angels arrived from sea and air, wave after wave, until freedom was restored. For the people of France, since June 6, 1944, you have always been their liberators. From the moment you arrived on this soil, it has been a part of you. On each anniversary, to the Norman people, you have been family and turning to all people. This is different. Your presence here is a testament to the boys who gave their lives. And with the same strength and honor you had nearly 80 years ago, you represent all those who fought to take back Europe. It was your duty to serve. It is our duty to remember. Remember. And the people of Normandy remember. It's amazing how important it is to give our veterans this last opportunity. I'm a 40 year veteran of Delta Airlines. I started loading bags in 97, and I am fortunate to be our senior vice president of global sales. I've never in my life been in a more impactful environment than I was last year in Normandy. Your duty to serve, our duty to remember. 
is my favorite line. That is the, that was the line that you heard time and time again. And that video that you just saw, you are the very first people to see that video. It is being in production and it'll be released here shortly. You, so you just saw a sneak preview, a world premiere, if you will. So to conclude, please let me do, uh, help me for a second to thank the people that make these returns possible. Specifically, you saw Donnie Edwards, my friend, president of the Best Defense Foundation. He's here with us tonight. David Chapman, Vice President of Public Affairs, representing our great partner, Michelin. Ambassador Billy, who is a great partner and friend of ours and has been incredibly helpful to us in our endeavors. Colonel Dutron for the support of this Herzog mission and not only for helping us set up tonight and giving us the opportunity to position ourselves tonight with all of you. Thank you, Colonel Dutron. And Virginie Dora who is a member of my global sales team at Delta and a native of Normandy who is also here tonight, who has helped not only the charter, but in so much more, but has led the entire uh, engagement for the last three years for Delta Airlines. I'm so incredibly proud of her. I'm also very proud of the region of Normandy, including Deauville and Caen, and frankly, everyone in Normandy. Uh, if you saw, if you, when you to see the video, how they welcomed these veterans was extraordinary. So thank you. We are very excited. We are beginning this event tonight and for the rest of the year until June, June 3rd or June 2nd when we leave. We'll be very, very excited about this. Thank you for your time and your support. I'll be into Normandy. Hi guys, uh, I guess this is a really hearty bunch uh, coming out tonight in the cold. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Um, I have always been fascinated by D-Day. So when my friend Pascal asked me to moderate this discussion, I jumped at the chance to actually be able to sit down with historians and discuss the largest amphibious landing in history uh, is an opportunity that no Pentagon reporter uh, would ever pass up. I'm Helene Cooper. I cover the Pentagon for the New York Times. Uh, welcome tonight. So we all know how hard amphib amphibious assaults are. Uh, that's about as tricky a uh, military maneuver as you're ever going to get. Uh, to land on a hostile shore under fire by sea is no small feat, as we know throughout history. I mean, look at the uh, Trojan War, look at the Bay of Pigs, even the ones that are successful, uh, like Okinawa and D-Day, uh, Norm the Normandy landings were still hugely, hugely bloody. Uh, so it's, I think it's a really, it's, it's an opportunity for us tonight to actually be able to sit down with three people who could help us to delve into one of the most uh, thrilling and meaningful amphibious assaults in military history. Welcome, uh, Craig. Uh, welcome, Michael and Frank. <laughs> So we're going to have a conversation. We're going to be very informal and eventually you guys can ask questions. But I thought we would open up with um, me just throwing a question out to all three of you. When was the first time that you guys, do you remember the first time you ever went to, that you went to Normandy? Can you each tell me about what you felt, what you saw, and just what it meant to you? Well, I'll start. I guess the Navy should go first. It's only appropriate. Just did a lot of that tonight. <laughs> uh, very clearly, it was 30 years ago. I was uh, a, a visiting professor at the British Naval Academy, teaching strategic studies to 1920 year old Royal Navy midshipmen. And one element of their uh, program was to conduct what a civilian college would call field trip, which military people call a staff ride, across the channel to the landing beaches. We spent a week studying the landings, planning for the landing, the things that go, could go wrong and did. So we crossed the channel, we went along the beach, and I talked to my students about uh, the German defenses, about the Canadian and British beaches, and of course, Omaha Beach. And then we climbed to the top of the bluff and arrived at the American cemetery. 
and my students, being very sensitive, said to me, sir, we know you need a, need a minute. We'll be right over there. And truth be told, I did need a minute. And if you've not been there, that vista of those crosses with occasional stars of David in their midst, stretching across that immaculate green grass is a vista you'd never forget. But that was my first visit. Um, that's, that's an incredible story, actually. It must have been weird being there with Brits, where they focusing on like Sword and Juno, and you're like, let's go. I mean, one of the things they had done is seen in the longest day, so they wanted to find out where John Wayne was. <laughs> and all the other people that they'd seen in the film. But no, they, they were sent. You mentioned that it's an amphibious operation and how difficult it is. Remember, this is a joint operation, meaning that it's air, ground, and sea, but it's also a combined operation of multiple nations cooperating together, which multiplies the complexity. And I think what we were trying to imbue to them is the difficulty of making that work. And I think they got it. Michael. First time I was there was with my wife Barbara. We were doing a Brittany Normandy trip. I think we had a, what, a water pump fall out of a car in Brittany. We had a tough trip. Um, but when we first got to Normandy, uh, we went to the site of the British landings here, Pegasus Bridge. And you walk across the bridge, and there's a very small building right across the, the canal called the Cafe Vendre, which was so the, which claims to be, I think it is, the first building uh, liberated uh, on June 6th. And you walk in. And on the walls, I mean, every bit of square inch that is available in the building are nailed up squadron patches from mostly American, but British and Canadian uh, military units from people that have been there and they put their squadron patch up on the wall. So when I went a couple of years later with Air Force Academy cadets, when I was teaching uh, there, I told them each to bring a, a squadron patch and put it on the wall too. And I remember they really had a difficult time finding open space uh, to put it. But to me, that building was such a symbol of the connection that Normandy creates between the United States, Britain, France, um, in that moment, on that time. And 80 years later, I'm sure this summer, if you go back there and try to put your squadron patch on the wall in the Cafe Ultra or your Delta Airlines patch, it is not going to be easy to do. And it, it just symbolizes uh, what that place means. That's so interesting. Um, what about you, Frank? Uh, the first time I went to Normandy, I want to turn this thing on. Uh, the first time I went to Normandy, I can narrow down to the exact day, uh, July 26, 2019. Uh, my father in law graciously uh, helped this relatively poor curator afford to go over there. Uh, my wife was pregnant with our first child and having morning sickness, uh, but we went to the Normandy American Cemetery. Before that, though, we stopped by a small village called Vilville. And that's where, on that day, 75 years to the day, my great uncle, uh, Captain Warren Walter Wooden, Easy Company Commander, 2nd Infantry Regiment, 5th Infantry Division, was killed about 10 a.m. by German artillery. And then we went to Colvers uh, there, to the Normandy American Cemetery, and I visited his grave. Now, his grave, for those who've ever visited the cemetery, the graves at the farthest back from the entrance were actually the first, and he's in only the second row in. So he was actually one of the very first Americans ever interned there. So it was very moving for the first time to get to meet my great uncle, who, as a little boy, now according to, uh, that I'd always heard stories about my great uncle. I didn't know him, but uh, this is what he did. This is where he was. And it meant a great deal to see how well he had been cared for by the French government by the American government, and we're very honored to this day that he rests peacefully in France with over 9,000 other Americans in the cemetery. Wow. And that was my first memory of Normandy. Wow. Is your aunt here? Hey, Jane, are you here? Yeah. I don't know. She's not raising Frank her. was worried about whether his aunt was you know, my aunt is the daughter of the man. Yeah. My, uh, my great aunt actually never met her father. He went overseas uh, before uh, she was born, so she never had a chance to meet him, unfortunately. Um, these are like these are the sort of stories that you have to have if you go to, to Normandy, if you're in that American cemetery or any of these number of places uh, in this this area where so much history uh, took place. The first time I went to Normandy was just a year and a half ago. 
Um, and I went with General Mark Milley, who at the time was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And going, and this was uh, the anniversary, the 78th anniversary as it happens, uh, the D-Day landings. And um, if you go to Normandy with Mark Milley, it's sort of like going to a mall with Beyonce. <laughs> especially at that time because he a he was he is such a historian and he had so many stories to tell and he wanted to shake the hand of every single person in that entire region of of, of france it felt like he spent six and a half hours in the cemetery but it also when you're traveling with him you're traveling with all of these um these uh, military guys, and we had uh, the Army Rangers on our trip. All wanted to go to Pontu Hawk, and the the we had uh, airborne guys, and they all wanted to go to La Fer Bridge, and they they're you know talking about no that that famous quote, no better day to die, or about the American airborne. Um, Oh, Jews who made that stand there. It was so fascinating. And I'm originally from Liberia, West Africa. I have no ties at all to this region. I don't have any French people in my family. I don't have American. Uh, uh, I don't have American ancestors who died on that beach. And it's still incredibly, incredibly moving when you you stand in the American cemetery. You travel through the region and you experience both the the warm embrace of the people there and that uh, that video we just saw sort of hinted at, uh, but also, you know, this is a site where uh, that to this day we're free today because of uh, what happened, what happened there. And so it's I, that's part, all part of the reason why I'm so happy to be doing this. Um, we're going to start with Normandy and then we're going to make our way to Provence and then we're going to end up in Paris. Uh, so uh, let's start with Craig. Can you just give us a little bit of the uh, a perspective about of how important the Normandy landings uh, became to be? There's the one thing I sort of wanted to start with is the thing about the American military. If you cover them, as I do. What they always say to reporters whenever anything is delayed, and they delay stuff all the time, including last week when we everybody knew that they were about to strike the Houthis and they didn't do it and they kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And once again, last week they said, well, you know, D-Day was delayed. So let's start with that. It was supposed to be on, wasn't even supposed to be on June 6th, right? Well, in, when you're studying a military campaign of any kind, uh, there are several layers of things to think about. There's the political, there's the strategic, there's the logistic. And if we start with the political level, you've got three players here, each with a different point of view. Stalin thought that invasion should have taken place immediately, 1942 or earlier, because he's fighting 220 German divisions along an 1800 mile front. His, his arm, the Red Army, dying like flies while the Anglo-Americans are having conversations. And this is driving him crazy. So he wants that invasion to take place immediately. Winston Churchill, on the other hand, who had been a major in the trenches in World War I, who had witnessed the evacuation from Dunkirk, and who uh, he had seen what happened when they tried to land in a raid at Dieppe in August of 1942. Churchill was in no hurry whatsoever. His view was, now wait a minute, let me understand this. Nazis are killing communists, and communists are killing Nazis. Why are we in a hurry to stop that? So that's a bit flippant, but I think that really is at the core of his view. So let's not hurry this thing. The United States, of course, our whole attitude, our whole culture is based on if something needs to be done, let's do it now. So George Marshall, who was the Army Chief of Staff, wanted to invade Europe in 1943. Stalin wanted to invade sooner than that. It's not clear that Winston Churchill wanted to invade at all. Uh, he was kind of dragooned into it. We'll talk about Operation Dragoon later. But in a way, that all had to be worked out first. And then on the second day, when we get down to the logistic problem, here the difficulty is shipping. There weren't enough ships to get everybody to England in the first place. And then across the channel, in the second place with the specialized kind of landing craft necessary to make this happen. So on a political level and on a logistic level, there were very complicated problems that had to be resolved before it could happen. What did Eisenhower want? 
Eisenhower was a good soldier. Honest to God, he was a good soldier. I miss him still. Um, Eisenhower wanted to do what could be done. He was a, a considered George Marshall his mentor. So he uh, he supported George Marshall on the idea that the sooner we can conduct this, the shorter the war will be, the more lives will be saved. But he was also a realist in terms of I can't make this invasion without the minimum amount of landing craft, particularly LSTs, necessary to get them into LSTs. LSTs. You got to defy that. LSTs. LSTs, landing ship tanks, the big 309 foot long uh, ships that could deposit tanks and loaded trucks right onto the beach. That was the, the key bottle. Oh, these. No, no, this, these are Higgins boats. These are oh, lands. Right. Uh, the, the LSTs, I don't know if we got a picture of those or not, but they're the big, they have these big bow doors that open like a cupboard and tanks and jeeps and trucks can drive right out of them. That was the bottleneck. Ah, so what, so they, they couldn't have started sooner than the Allies. <laughs> Probably not. It's amazing. People, you know, the, 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 when you when you look at the American military, the, the sexy guys are the, the special ops and the troops and the Marines, and those are the guys who get, you know, the parachuters and the people who get all the injection. But logistics is such a big deal. Moving an army the size of ours all the way to Europe is just like a monumental task. And it's something that in a lot of ways, is that partly why we're already there now? This whole idea of, you know, you always already in the kill zone that, you know, the Marines talk about now. Well, the idea is to preposition as much as you can near the place where there's likely to be conflict. You can't always do that, of yeah. course. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Let me respond slightly differently to you. We couldn't have done it sooner. We could have done it sooner if, we had ignored the Mediterranean. If we had never gone into North Africa, never gone into Sicily, never gone into Italy, an invasion in 1943 might have been possible. But that that's one of those huge what ifs that is moot. Uh, my next question goes out. I, it's probably, probably, you know, to any of the three of you, but there were five beaches in America. We hear the most about Utah and Omaha. Omaha was by far the bloodiest. Why is that? Well, I'll take that one, but if we could go back to some of the pictures a little further. Right there. Stop here. Okay, this photograph is from May 17th, 1944. Has anyone here seen the movie Saving Private Ryan? That sector, dog green. And the draw, if you see the drop there in the terrain, this is where the member, this is where Tom Hanks comes ashore in the film. But specifically, this is where the men of the 116th Infantry Regiment, which was a Virginia National Guard unit, will come ashore. Now, at the bottom here, the German beach obstacles you see, those are called Belgian gates. And then you have these wooden posts, and there's a German teller mine up top. Then you have what are called Czech, Czech hedgehogs. Then you go further up to the shingle, there's a, a seawall. And then hidden up there in the cliffs are lots of little German resistance nests and lots of machine guns. Uh, the landing craft are going to drop the men off right here in the surf. And then you have to get from point A to point B. Not easily done. The intent was that they were going to use American heavy bombers, B-24 Liberators, and they were going to drop ordnance right here on these German positions prior to the American landings. In addition to that, it would leave craters on the beach so that there would be some cover and defilade for the infantry. In addition, the United States Navy was going to bring in rocket ships, and they were going to blast these defenses with rockets. In addition to that, you'd have what were called gap assault teams made up of uh, U.S. Navy personnel, in many cases former CBs, U.S. Navy CBs, as well as Army engineers, and they were going to clear all these beach obstacles so that everyone could get ashore without any issue. The German defenses would be blasted away. Everything would be hunky-dory. And the best laid plans of mice and men, unfortunately, did not come to pass. There was a lot of concern about fratricide, particularly by the use of heavy bombers. There was also some cloud cover, so they delayed their bomb release. And we killed, sorry, a lot of French cows. So we Sorry for that. Uh, so most of the bombs fell inland. Uh, the rockets were fired too far out to sea. They landed in the surf. Now, Company A of the 116th Infantry Regiment did manage to land precisely here at about 6.30 a.m., and they offloaded about 6.36. And within 10 minutes, they were ceased to exist as a fighting unit. 
If there's anyone here from Bedford, Virginia, or have heard from Bedford, Virginia, there were 34 men in Company A who were citizens of Bedford. 19 would be killed right here within about 10 to 20 minutes. Three more would be killed in the ensuing days. So 22 men out of 34 from that town never came home. That's a, that is why the National D-Day Memorial is in Bedford, Virginia. Roanoke, Virginia, uh, I think that was Company D. They lost 20 men at D-Day. Uh, the 116th just got decimated here because air power failed in its job. Unfortunately, with due respect, right? The Naval Bombardment failed in his job. Omar Bradley arguably failed in his job because he didn't listen uh, to experts from the uh, bombardments in the Pacific saying you need a much longer sustained Naval Bombardment. Nah, they don't need that, don't worry about that. So unfortunately that didn't come to pass. Despite all of that, the men still managed to get up at the tops of the bluff by early afternoon. They still managed to make it up there. And how is, that's, only those, only those who were there could tell us exactly how they did it. I feel obligated to say a few words in defense of the Navy. Totally fair. The overall plan for the invasion of Normandy counted on a one-hour bombardment. Now, would a longer bombardment have been better? Yes. And on the Pacific Islands, they did use longer bombardments because Pacific Islands were islands. Reinforcements couldn't come to those islands once they were cut off. So you could bombard them for weeks. But if you bombard a section of the coast and let the Germans know this is where we're coming, that gives them an opportunity to bring those reinforcements there. So it was a conscious decision. We're going to bombard them for one hour and then we're going to go ashore amidst the smoke and the dust. And the idea is that surprise is at least as important, important as a naval bombardment. So that's part of what's going on there. True, no disagreement. Uh, but when, if, if you, you, it's such a roll of the dice, though, when you think about it. You have these five beaches. You have Juno, you have Sword, you have Gold, Omaha, and Utah. And the U.S. drew the short stick. I wouldn't necessarily argue that. Uh, Omaha was the hardest beach by far because of the width of the beach itself. Do everybody know it's going to be the hardest one? I think that most of the planners realize, yes, Omaha would be the worst. But the reason they needed to have it would be... Wait, wait, wait. No, back up. Why did they know that it was going to be the worst? The new Omaha... Did the Americans automatically just get the worst beach? <laughs> no, but was it a case of the Americans can handle this one, the other side? And this is, these are the sort of questions that my 13-year-old nephew asked me. I, defer, I, I like to describe this on the gesture between two kings, but uh, what I would like to say is to some extent, yes. And they sent in the 29th Infantry Division, an untested division, but recognizing the danger, they reinforced them with the 1st Infantry Division, which had a lot of combat experience in North Africa and was some of the first American forces to, to actually fight overseas in the European. This is another reason why they said we're going to put in this tremendous aerial bombardment. We're also going to have a naval bombardment, as, Dr. as Craig mentioned. And, but there was this awareness. It's a very wide beach, so the men have to cross a lot of terrain. You also have the heights, which can be, those cliffs can be up to 200 feet high. But you have Utah Beach over to the far flank. In between that, you have Point Hawk, and we saw the footage there in the film earlier with the gun battery up there that had to be taken out by the second ranger. I so want to talk about Point Hawk. And they realized if we're going to have this one lodgement, this one front, we can't leave a gap because that allows the Germans the opportunity to essentially exploit that gap, isolate the force there at Utah Beach, Point Hawk, and cut off and destroy that force, and then turn their efforts over to the British and the Canadian forces at Gold June. On the sword. There is also the fact that there's a very good German division that had moved just south of Omaha Beach very late in the planning process. Mm -hmm. So um, Craig alluded to it. Well, well, sorry, Frank alluded to it. What they're trying to do is avoid the two mistakes they made in Italy. The landing at Salerno, they went in too far too fast and created these fingers that could be attacked. Mm -hmm. Anzio, they went in too slow like a fist. And what they're trying to do is avoid that problem here. Uh, did the Americans consciously take the beach they knew was worse? I don't think so. Um, you just can't plan how things are going to go, but uh, a major factor of this is that there was an entire German division that was not accounted for in the initial planning. That's a huge, that's a big deal. And these are the guys who, when we have our classic, you know, what we think of as Hollywood, you know, D-Day, these are the guys who are out there in those charts, in those 
those defensive positions. And this speech is actually, if we went back to Omaha, it's actually worse than it even looks on there because the Germans actually have machine guns that can go across parallel to the short line. So those metal X's that you see, psychologically what they're expecting is that, that soldiers are going to want to hide behind the metal X's for protection and then the machine guns sweep across the beaches. So if you get the opportunity to go here to Omaha, you can hike up to the top of the cliffs and look down on it and you can see just what an unbelievable military problem it's, that was. It's, it's even worse than it looks from this picture if you can imagine that. Yeah. Uh, just one quick note about why the Americans got the two westernmost beaches, and and it's logistics again. The, the notion was that after the first 15 or so waves get ashore, the logistical support would be coming from the United States to the western side of the Cotentin Peninsula, whereas the British and Canadians would be reinforcing supply from across the channel, so that the Americans getting the westernmost beaches would would make that resupply more convenient. Um, on this trip a year and a half ago that I took to Normandy with Millie, the other reporter on the trip, there were two reporters on the trip, and the other reporter was Sylvie Lantome, who is a reporter with AFP, Agence France Press, and she was overcome when we got there because she kept saying that um, after we would get into arguments because she didn't like the fact that they call it Omaha Beach because she was like, that's not the name. It's a track. We're still in France. Uh, she started when we got to the cemetery crying because she said it, it, she was she was overcome. She said that the idea that for her uh, all of these young men died. Michael, can you talk a little bit uh, from the French perspective about this? But so he was saying it's sort of like a bald uh, uh, truth, but it's a lot more complicated than that. For it is a lot more complicated. Uh, France has an extremely complicated Second World War history, as I'm sure many of you in here know. So the question for the Allies, frankly, is how much damage can you do to France in the act of liberating it? And who will end up running this country when you're done? And that's a question that even as late as June 6th is an open question. The Allies kept Charles de Gaulle at arm's length. They didn't tell him anything about the invasion of North Africa. And he was furious because North Africa was French. Algeria was French. They told him as little as possible about this operation. And there were many Americans who thought, look, we'll get into France. We'll figure something else out. We'll push him aside. We'll, we'll, we'll figure something else out. But it's not going to be Charles de Gaulle. And Charles de Gaulle had a very different perspective on what this was going to look like. So just before June 6th, he was head of something called the Provisional Government of the Republic of France. He dropped the word provisional just before D-Day, as if to make a statement that once we get into France, it's mine, it's not yours. And he does this speech in Bayeux, in which that's effectively what he says, that we're liberating France and France is, is, is my movement. It doesn't belong to the Americans, it doesn't belong to the British. So there's that complication and, and that complication impacts the liberation of, of Paris too. But it's also the Allied bombardment of France, because in order to make this operation work, the Allies have to bombard not just D-Day, not just Normandy, because if you do that, you tell the Germans where you're going to go. You have to bombard all of northern France and bombard Paris. So the number of French who are killed doing this, I had a, a, a friend of mine many years ago, uh, his wife was from Normandy, and we, we had this conversation that his it, her mother used to say things like, uh, what a terrible thing it was to be to be targeted by the people who are coming to free you. Yeah. So th th this operation comes with a lot of these big strategic political questions that are really, really difficult. And I agree with Craig. Uh, it's really good that Dwight Eisenhower was the guy in charge of answering. Yeah. Um, La Ponte Rock, that's where the Rangers uh, came up this uh, pretty sheer cliff uh, under bombardment from the Germans. Who wants to take that one, Michael? Are you going to do it? You're the Army guy. <laughs> so for the record, I'm a civilian who works for the Army. Um, yeah, but you're representing them tonight. <laughs> but if I have a naval... I'm not even wearing green. Uh, the the Pontiac is uh, is this this bit of land that juts out. Uh, you can see Utah Beach and you can see Omaha Beach clearly. So if the Germans have operational artillery there, they can fire into the flank of Utah and they can fire into the flank of Omaha. And it's too small a place to be hit accurately by bombers, though they tried. And it's too small a place to be hit accurately by naval gunners, though they tried. So the plan, uh, to me, if you stand there, it, 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 it is actually a victim of erosion. So bits and pieces of it are falling off all the time, uh, though they're trying to, to find a way to fix that. 
But I would encourage all of you to stand there and imagine these guys literally using grappling hooks and ladders to climb up to the top of this this, this piece of ground. Uh, and the tragedy, of course, is they get up there to find out that the artillery pieces had not yet been in place. They were up there, but they weren't active. Uh, but it is one of those things you, you do. You stand there and you say, how did people do this? Uh, yet they did. Uh, and uh, Texas A&M University, um, um, the, the, the lead officer, Colonel Rutter, later became president of A&M. I think that's right. Uh, so A&M is actively involved in trying to figure out a way to either stop this erosion or figure out some way to at least stop the subsidence. But uh, it's a place you've got to go. And when you go, you'll see all the bomb craters and everything uh, as, as the Navy and Air Force was trying to solve this problem for the Rangers. But it took it took Army guys uh, to literally climb up the side of this rock. And, and it is just an incredible thing to see. You also see, if you go there, the German uh, the German positions. You can go into the the caves that they use. You can go into the positions. You can go where they dug in, and you can see through the windows where they're looking, where they're shooting uh, uh, from. It's 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 pretty it's pretty amazing. Um, uh, Frank, uh, coming back to you, tell us a story. There are a lot of moments of like heroism, uh, you know, involving soldiers, sailors, uh, well, airmen. Tell us a D-Day one. Well, why don't we stick with Point Hawk? Okay. Uh, and also, for those who know, I research military homing pigeons. And yes, the Rangers love four homing pigeons up Point Hawk. <laughs> Uh, the reason being, I have to say that they took out these five, I think they were 155 millimeter guns. Now, when the rank, second rangers fought their way up, made it up to the top, they said, where are the guns? Start looking. And the first sergeant, Leonard Lamell, goes inland. And he goes about a mile, and finally he encounters, they actually have to find the guns, camouflaged, and they see, oh, look, they're the German gun crews having breakfast, despite all the cacophony of what's going on. And Lamel had what he and his colleagues had what they were called thermite grenades. And the they went to chemistry, you don't know what thermite is. It's things your mom and dad don't want you to play with at home, which I learned. But be that as it may, they were able to spike two of the guns and they smashed out the sights on the other guns and then ran back all the way to the cliffs to try and get more grenades. Unbeknownst to them, another squad came up, found the other guns, and spiked them. So there's this very unique story here with Sergeant Lamel that it's that individual initiative of a single American soldier. I think several historians have said probably made one of the most uh, momentous acts there on D-Day by spiking these guns and taking them out unbeknownst, to, right under the noses of the Germans. How many lives did they save? But tying into that, what about the lives? Let's go back to Omaha Beach. Now, I don't think we have a photograph here, but we did actually uh, one of Craig's photos with the LCs. You see all these barrage balloons up there on, on the beach. A lot of those were manned by, there we go. A lot of those are actually manned by African Americans of the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. Uh, they came ashore at the third wave at Omaha Beach. And one of the men who came ashore is a corporal, uh, Waverly B. Woodson. He was from Philadelphia. Uh, Woodson was a medic. And when his landing craft tank was coming in, uh, they actually, I think, hit a mine. Then uh, he was struck by a German artillery and had shrapnel wounds to his thigh, back, and groin. Then he makes it ashore. Now, as a medic, on the third wave, seeing what happened to all these other men there on, on the first two waves of Omaha Beach, for 30 consecutive hours, he will treat the wounded. He performs amputations, he splints wounds, he stops bleeding, uh, he runs, he provides blood, uh, white and black. Mind you, blood is actually segregated. Blood donations at this time are segregated in the US military. 30 consecutive hours. Then his own wounds are treated, and after three days, he says, send me back. Uh, he will be nominated for the Medal of Honor and never receive it, uh, likely on grounds of racism. Instead, he eventually, much belatedly, his family receives his bronze star uh, for meritorious service. Not with fee, but for meritorious service. There is a movement to try and get Woodson uh, the Medal of Honor, posthumously. But just one example, he, he is believed to have treated between 200 to 300 individual soldiers during that time. Uh, and didn't ask anything of himself. As a medic, he's unarmed. He is there to save lives, and he does. And that's just one, just one story of countless stories yeah, that can be yeah. shared from Omaha Beach. That's bone. That gives me chills right there. Um, uh, how much, since we're on, we're talking to you, Frank, how much does the Normandy D-Day 
landing still sort of singe the psyche of the American soldier today? I think popular culture has a lot to play in this, uh, be it video games, be it Hollywood, uh, be it print material, so to speak. D-Day, I and mean, even uh, General Eisenhower in his, in his great notice to soldiers, sailors, airmen of the Allied Expedition Force, you were on the Great Crusade mm -hmm. and framing it in this religious connotation that you know, you're going to free the oppressed from evil, which yeah. quite frankly was true. So a lot of American soldiers, uh, rangers today, the men of Point to Hawk, you know, this is the epitome of being a ranger. Uh, to those infantrymen, you know, who made it across Omaha Beach, who make it from Utah Beach, I would say that certainly for airborne forces, when we think yeah. of the effect of say, one of the most popular and cheapest reenacting uniforms is an American uh, M1942 airborne swap, because everybody wants to be in the 101st Airborne. Yeah, yeah, the 82nd, sir. Nobody wants that. They want the 101st. Everybody wants 101st. Do you have any 101st veterans here? No, 82nd. Come on. Good. There we go. Stand all, all American all the way. There we go. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. Fort Bragg slash Fort Liberty. It's all about the 82nd. Good. Thank you, sir. <laughs> but that's just so it. back to the 101st. Back to the 101st, yeah. But it's because of these 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 media that are consumed by ensuing generations yeah. that this is why Normandy has such a massive effect. In fact, the Normandy American Cemetery is the most heavily visited. American cemetery overseas by American Battle Monument that's overseen by the American Battle Monument Commission. Everybody goes there. I went to cemeteries and the mayors are gone that are far larger from the fighting in World War One. There's nobody there. No. You know, it's in Mary Glees, they still have that parachute in that church. Yeah. That's a man, by the way. <laughs> yes. Well, first of all, out of your system. that parachutist uh, is hanging on the wrong side of the church. <laughs> He actually landed on the other side, but nobody could see it from the narrow road, so they put it on the side next to the square so the tourists could look at it and take pictures well, of it. Hello. Well, yes. Like my editor told me uh, last week when they asked for a feature a profile on Lloyd Austin because of, you know, the whole freca about him being in the hospital and not telling anybody. I was like, but I wrote a profile of him last month. And she's like, well, maybe this month people will read it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> let's move on to uh, Craig, you're going to lead this one, and we have a video. Oh. Can you tell us what's happening? Uh, here? <laughs> well, it looks like they're being welcomed. I know, this looks like which which is a is this one of the, 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 the idea, for those who don't know, um, the idea was to have a landing in Normandy, the big landing, D-Day, the landing in Normandy, and at the same time, simultaneously, a landing in southern France along the Côte d'Azur in Provence, uh, where several divisions would go ashore. And it would be the anvil on which the Normandy hammer uh, descended so that the Germans would face what amounted to a pincer movement from two directions. Uh, originally, the Americans suggested this to sort of distract Winston Churchill from one of his bizarre suggestions, we need to land on the Isle of Rhodes, we need to take Crete, we need to go up the Adriatic Sea, anything but land in Normandy. Um, so to distract him, they said, well, how about a landing in Provence as a distraction? But when that was, was floated at the Tehran conference, Stalin, of all people, thought it was a great idea, and now it became a full-scale invasion. The problem was, we're back to shipping, logistics, there aren't enough landing craft to do both at the same time. So what happens is, talk about postponement, you led with that, the landing in Provence is postponed by two months, from uh, June to August. Uh, so it's not quite a pincer movement, but what that meant is in those two months, the Germans had moved a lot of their forces elsewhere so that the landings in Provence, you got this kind of reception instead of the struggle on the beaches, as you saw at, at the Omaha and elsewhere. Uh, in, in southern France, uh, it was a quick thrust ashore. Uh, the two French divisions rushed westward and took uh, Toulon and Marseille pretty quickly, and then they moved up the Rhone River Valley, and it was strategically quite a successful move, but almost accidentally. 
uh, because of the postponement, it gave them less opposition along the shore. It was just east of uh, Toulon. Um, it's actually a very difficult place to be at Central Pay. It's actually where the landing happened, so on the beautiful coast of Provence. Uh, that video, maybe someone here uh, can tell me, can tell us whether it's Marseille or Toulon, but Craig is right. It's basically uh, near Central Pay, and then they, they begin to move west. And the Provence operation is, is an odd one for me as an historian because we tend to study the things that either don't work, I'm going to do a thing at Gallipoli in April, which is famous because it didn't work, or Normandy, the things that are dramatic because they almost work, almost don't work, but do work. Provence works ahead of schedule. It works better than what they had planned. So for some reason, we historians ignore it. Um, it it's actually more important to the French in some ways than Overlord is, because whereas Overlord is it's French troops, right? It's French troops. Uh, under de Lach with the Tessigny, this very famous French general who had fought the Germans in 1942, very, very famous guy. Um, and, and this is uh, French troops with the assistance of the French resistance working in coordination very well in the south of France to liberate two very important Important French port cities, without which the logistical things that support the movement into, I believe this is right, 1945, Marseille is the most active port in Europe, and that's because of this. So it's critically important, but because it works really, really well, it rarely gets more than a paragraph or two in most World War II histories, if it gets that. And to tie into that, too, Cherbourg, which we finally have captured and intended to use, that the Germans are fantastic at breaking things and destroying things, and they completely destroyed and trashed the forts at Cherbourg. Marseille provided this tremendous port, which they still trashed, but not as badly, that we could use for the logistics piece that Eisenhower desperately needed to bring supplies ashore. And in conjunction with that, too, it's known as the Champagne Campaign by a lot of folks because, quite frankly, it worked really well. The losses were practically nil. I think at the one beach they lost 94 yeah. total. At Omaha, we lose 2,500 at Omaha alone. I mean, the casualties are minuscule. And the French forces under uh, the uh, uh, John de Lacher de Tassini are able to very quickly uh, scoop up Toulon and Marseille very within weeks, I think. Uh, the planning was September, and they're actually able to capture them before the end of August. So it moves extraordinarily quickly, catches the Germans somewhere off guard, and they immediately can begin pushing up north to link up with General Patton's Third Army. And then you have this one continuous line, essentially this one massive front pushing the Germans out of France. It's also a very nice place to do a staff ride if Delta Airlines wants to go to the south. Take me along. It's a very, very nice place to do a step right. But you're right, it's part of what Eisenhower wanted this broad front approach so the Germans couldn't concentrate at any point against the Allied line. But why was it so successful? Is part of the reason because the French resistance had tied up the German troops? Can you talk a little bit about that? That's part of the reason. Uh, part of the reason is that once D Day happens, the Germans are already in the South, are already worried about how they're going to get back to the German border. They're not really worried about digging in quite the way that they were in Omaha. Um, it is partly that um, the, the planning of the operation, there are fewer details really that can go horribly wrong. The planning is, is, is easier to do there. The weather is more predictable, all kinds of things like that. And once the thing begins to succeed, success builds upon success and you can continue to go with it. So um, I think a lot of credit has to go too to the French forces that landed there. Their desire to be a part of the liberation of their homeland is really, really important to this. Uh, they're not coming from um, and, and the wonderful things the Americans, Canadians, and British did, these are French people liberating their own homeland. And that really mattered. In the psyche, I know I keep asking these psyche questions, but, you know, are people at this point now thinking the tide of the war has turned or is it still too early? I think so. I think by this point, it's, it's pretty obvious to most uh, allied planners that, that you're going to win the war. The question now is when you're going to win it and what Europe, what France and Europe are going to look like when this is over. This is Churchill's big concern. We want to shake hands with the Russians as far east as possible. We don't want to leave them in control of Vienna and Berlin and who knows what else, Brussels, Copenhagen. We don't want to do that. We want to meet them as far east as possible. Whereas Eisenhower's thinking, my job is to defeat the German army. It's not to defeat the Soviet army. They're still our allies. And again, this question of what's going to happen to France, what will France look like when this is over? Who's going to run it? Will there be a civil war? Will there be a revolution? The United States is planning for a full military occupation of France, just in case they need to do it. So th those are big, big questions. But I think in terms of what's going to happen to the Germans, 
it's pretty obvious by the summer of 44. We, we do this and then the Soviets do a massive invasion of their own through what's now Belarus and Ukraine, mm-hmm. ironically and oddly enough, um, just just destroying the German armies that are in the East. And I think we need to say just a bit more about that. There was an understanding among the three partners, the Allies, that when D-Day took place, the Russians would have a, a simultaneous advance in the Eastern Front called Operation Bagration. Stalin waited a few days. Uh, June 6th was the landing. He didn't launch the counteroffensive on the Eastern Front until June 22nd. Maybe to make sure they were actually going to get ashore, uh, but also because it was the anniversary of the German invasion of the Soviet Union, which was symbolic. But that was an enormous invasion coming from the east. And so this race, race to Berlin, which has been overblown a bit. But again, the idea is, could we have had a spearhead to get to Berlin first ahead of the Soviets? But the occupational zones had already been set up and agreed to. So even if the Allies, the Western Allies, the Anglo-American, Franco-Anglo-American Allies had gotten to Berlin first, it wouldn't have mattered. So Yeah, there is an exchange between Churchill and Roosevelt about exactly this. And Churchill makes the case again. We should get into Berlin and keep the Soviets out. We should do this. We should do that. And Roosevelt, who was sick and dying by this point, simply wrote Churchill back and said, I do not get your point. Why would we do this? So, Provence, but before we go, before I want to use because Provence is happening pretty much the same time as the liberation of Paris there. Uh, but, Frank, I'm supposed to check in with you for each stage for cool stories. Okay, cool story. What you got? Provence. Well, well, as a curator, I'm a, essentially a professional hoarder for the American government. That's what I do. Give me your closet, give me your clothes, and I'll stick them in a the box somewhere. But, with, with uh, I'll come back to the 551st in a second. Uh, so there's a young man who will land uh, on the beaches on August 15th. He's from Hunt County, Texas. He's 19 years old. He's five foot five and a half. Uh, what, he tries to join the paratroopers, and they say no. He tries to join the Marines, and they went no. Finally, the Army says, yeah, we'll take you. And so he, joined, he joins the United States Army, uh, I think about the... 1943, uh, he gets shot for the first time in his life, and he passes out in basic training. He said, let's make you a baker. He says, no, nope, not going to do it. Uh, finally, he'll make his way to North Africa, but the fighting's over. He makes his way then to Sicily and gets his first taste of combat in Sicily. He then finds himself at Anzio with the third with uh, Baker Company of the 15th Infantry Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division, fighting through the, the misery of Anzio. And then he finds himself in Provence on August 15th. And there he is as a staff sergeant, and he's told to take Pilbox Hill. Uh, He encounters German forces, engages them with his carbine, says, I need something bigger, goes back and finds a machine gun squad, says, you're not using that, I'll take that. Takes the machine gun, moves up to engage the Germans. And his best friend, 30-year-old Laddie Tipton of Irwin, Tennessee, says, I want to join you. Says, no, I got this. He says, no, no, let me come and join you. They engage a German machine gun position, uh, just eliminated. At that point, his friend Laddie says, hey, I, think I see a white flag. I think they're surrendering them. The Germans are surrendering. Uh, and he stands up the Germans kill him on the spot. At that point, his friend kind of, he can't fully describe what happened. He kind of lost it, one could say. And for the next hour, he single-handedly will kill six Germans, I think wound two or four, capture 11, single-handedly takes this hill. And he, for this action, he will receive the Distinguished Service Cross. And his name is Audie Leon Murphy. And if anyone's ever heard of the story of Audie Murphy, I don't need to explain much more. This is actually the second decoration he'll ever receive for valor. But it, it's there in Provence that something is unleashed in him with the death of his best friend, Laddie Tipton, who had a 12-year-old daughter who wrote letters. And Audie really, Audie had a fifth grade education. He is Writing, we'll just say, was limited at the time. Laddie is kind of this older male figure to him. Laddie reads the letters of his daughter to Audie and so forth. And so his death deeply troubles him and will always trouble him. Uh, his book, To Hell and Back, is Laddie's dedicated to one of the two soldiers. And in 1949, on his book tour, Audie meets Laddie's daughter and gives her his Distinguished Service Cross and says, you deserve this in memory of her father. And so Laddie's technically I think, one of under 100 American soldiers actually killed of of the 3rd Infantry Division that first day, but one whose death, I don't want to say inspires, is probably an inappropriate word, but certainly motivates 
Audie Murphy to perform these incredible, almost chaotic acts of heroism through the liberation of France and then on into Germany. I hope that was a sufficient story. <laughs> that was not. I'm by the Smithsonian. We have a super not you can see it. Um, Okay. Uh, that's an amazing story. Uh, I had not heard of that. Um, wow. uh, so, the liberation of Paris. Michael, you're up. <laughs> well, as all of you know, you can have breakfast in Paris, you can get in the car, and you can have lunch in Normandy. It's that close. The GD invasion happens on June 6th. Paris is not liberated until August 25th. That's a long time. And one of the reasons it's a long time is that the American planners had no intention of liberating Paris. They had seen Mark Clark go for Rome just before D-Day and realized what a tactical mistake that was to let the Germans escape. What the Americans do not want is to let the Germans get out of Paris and get to the old high ground of the Western Front of World War I. That's a nightmare. You could fight for the city and it could suffer the fate of Warsaw, where it is completely flattened. The Americans don't want either one of those two things, and the British want nothing to do with Paris. They want to get to Antwerp, they want to get to the port cities, they want to completely bypass Paris. So the American uh, statements, the American senior leaders say, we're not going to go into Paris unless it looks like there's a revolution, or if we have evidence that the people of Paris are starving. And as you know, Normandy is where a lot of Paris's food comes from. So when the Americans and British and Canadians show up there, it actually cuts off the main food source for the city. And once the Germans realize that they're going to be kicked out of Normandy and they're going to have to leave Paris, they start taking everything they can take, and that includes food. So you're actually running into the risk of both of those things happening, either a civil war and or a literal famine. And many American GIs who went through Paris uh, left documents talking about how starved and how hungry the people of Paris looked. And then in late August uh, 1944, uh, it is the Paris police that are the first to rise up. There is a monument on the headquarters of the Paris police, a place called the Conciergerie, right across from Notre Dame. Uh, when the Germans ask the Paris police to turn in their weapons, and the Paris police refuse. And in this Conciergerie, they take down the um, German occupation flag and they fly the French, the beautiful French tricolor, which can now be seen all over Paris. So that's the clear sign that something is going on, something is happening. And then it's finally uh, Omar Bradley's decision that the United States cannot let the Germans just slaughter Parisians. They've got to get into the city and do something. All the while, the French general, uh, General Leclerc, had been borrowing, begging, stealing, gasoline, ammunition, spare tires, whatever he could, to get his second armored division, he's the, the most important unknown person of World War II, uh, General Leclerc, to get his guys closer and closer and closer and closer to Paris, defying American orders, angering every American in the chain of command. And finally, uh, Brad, I think it's Bradley who tells Patton to tell Leclerc, you've got your chance, now go. And what they find in the city is a German command structure that is trying to empty Paris. It doesn't want to fight for it, and it doesn't want to blow it up either. Because if they blow up the city and its bridges and everything else, the Germans who are west of the city can't get east of the city. What the Germans in the city really want is for some senior American, hopefully American officer, not French, with stars on their shoulders that they can surrender to so the French resistance won't chop them to pieces. That's what they're waiting for. And finally, in late August, that's what they get. Um, so it's a really, really complicated story. Immediately, there are myths that crop up about it, the most famous being the General von Koltitz, the German. All he had to do was push a button, and the city would have blown up. It's not true. Uh, it's part of a post-war myth to make the liberation of Paris almost a founding stone on which Franco-German friendship can be built back up. The myth is that Koltitz so loved Paris that he couldn't touch it. Now, what we know is Koltitz uh, ended up going to prison in, of all places, Camp Shelby in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where we lived for a while, and uh, his cell was bugged. So while he was talking about how much he loved Paris when there were reporters around, when there were, when there were interviewers around, when he got back to his cell, he would say things like, man, I really hated the French, I hated the Parisians, I wish they would have given me one of those buttons because I would have loved to have used it. So uh, it's all part of this attempt to sort of rebuild Franco-German friendship after the war, and all, all of us historians know this, um, sometimes really bad history can be really good politics, and this is one of those occasions. Wow. Uh, that's as quick that's as a, I can do it. Yeah, that's a, no, that's a, that's a great story. What was the, what was the um, atmosphere in Paris, in, the, in Paris, uh, in the days between D-Day and the liberation of Paris? 
the, the French resistance that is inside Paris is mostly left-leaning. They're socialist and communist for the most part. Uh, and the men who's doing most of the organizing, uh, Henri Roltangui and his wife Cecile, are doing most of the, uh, Claire, excuse me, uh, who are doing most of the organizing, are doing a lot of it underground. He had worked underground. So the, uh, the new museum to the French uh, resistance and the liberation of Paris is in the underground tunnels that Roltangui used. You can, you can walk down the steps into the old electricity and telephone tunnels. And they're the perfect place for a headquarters. You can cut telephone service to any part of the city you want. You can cut electricity to any part of the city you want. You can walk through the metro tunnels to get to any part of the city you want. It's perfect. What he wasn't counting on, though, was the police raising that flag, yeah. which speeds the timetable up really, really quickly. And it's that, uh, that, that, that fact that there is actual combat going on in the city that convinces the Americans they've got to do something. What they're not clear on is what it is they want to do. What they don't want to do is liberate the city from the Nazis and hand it to communists. So there's a deal eventually cut. Roald Sanghi is very upfront with de Gaulle and, and the Gaullists that he wants to liberate the city and he wants to kill Germans. The political future of France will wait till the end. So the deal they cut is take our French resistance guys, our communist French resistance guys, and we will form units of the French army that will go all the way to Strasbourg and into Germany if you want. The only thing we want at the end are elections when this is over. De Gaulle can't be installed by the American army. There has to be some voice by the French people. And that's the deal that they cut. Um, and it's a credit to both Roald Tanguy and Charles de Gaulle and the people around him that you go from the liberation of Paris after a couple of chaotic weeks to a relatively stable post-war French government. We're going to open uh, this up to questions soon. Uh, I have one last question for each one of you, and then you guys can have a shot at it. Uh, this is the same question for each one. It demands an answer. Uh, what's the best World War II movie? <laughs> Okay, since I was supposed to be the aviation guy here, I'm going to say 12 o'clock high, because I always like Gregory Peck. never see that. What? <laughs> Gregory Peck, 12 o'clock high, about the uh, strategic policy. It's fantastic. I really like it. Although, from a foreign film perspective, I would say Die Brücke, which is an anti-war German film made in West Germany in the 1950s, is actually a relatively unknown film today, but I think it's a very good film about kind of the, the pointlessness of the end of the war, particularly for the German people as they begin to... I realize I'm in the French embassy, I'm talking about a German film, please don't hold it against me. But I think it's a very good, I think it's a very good film to kind of express some of the sentiments about what was the point of any of this. And so there, that, that's my example, or my offer. So. Michael, what you got? Oh, everybody that knows me knows my answer is going to be my wife certainly knows my answer by my daughter shaking her head. There is only one answer, and it's Casablanca, which is made during the war and does a beautiful job of depicting the, the tensions, ambiguities, and difficulties of France, whether it's Vichy, whether it's pro Charles de Gaulle. There is a moment when Humphrey Bogart asks Claude Rains, Louis, are you pro Vichy or free French? And he just refuses to answer the question. So to me, that, that film, partly because it was made while all these events were going on, is the absolute perfect uh, thing in the book that I wrote on U.S. relations with Vichy. Uh, I had to fight with my publisher, Harvard Press, a little bit, but eventually got them to agree that each of the chapter titles would be a quotation from the movie. And I'm really glad to believe that you get away with that. The New York Times would never let you do that. That in, in the week prior to Roosevelt's trip to Casablanca for the conference that he had with Churchill, uh, he showed that film in the White House uh, pre-release, and it was a closely held secret that he was going, and he just chuckled to himself all the way through it, because he knew he was going there, and almost nobody else in the room was aware of it. That's a good choice. I I'm going to be old-fashioned and say uh, The Longest Day uh, is, is a, a, a great film that still stands up. It does. But I will add, the first 15 minutes of Saving Private Ryan are unmatched. Yeah. Yeah. You'd go dust boot or something like that. Something yeah. like that. Uh, we're opening it up for questions. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Yeah. What's your favorite World War II film? Oh, obviously The Longest Day. And the first 15 minutes of Crackle. <laughs> I completely 1,000%. I've never heard.